Okay, welcome everybody um, to the September 21st meeting of the Housing and Economic Development Committee for the Town of Hadley. Um, just to get started at the beginning, I uh, just wanted to kick off with uh, an ad administrative matter. Um, I believe at the last meeting, which I wasn't unable to attend, uh, on the agenda we had the um, existence now of a volunteer committee handbook. Um, and I believe that that was distributed to everybody. I just wanna make sure you all received that via email. Yeah. Um, so if you did, one of the things, we're really trying to do our best to educate people on open meeting law. And I think that's um, an area of, of, always an area that's a challenge um, when we have so many people who are on volunteer boards in town. So the select board uh, did push forward to make sure that this handbook was uh, updated. Uh, there was one in existence, but this is a little bit more robust and more detailed relative to how meetings need to be conducted, what open meeting law is all about, uh, along with many other things, just about what it means to be a good volunteer for our town. So we are actually asking each committee chair to make sure that all committee members have um, received the handbook and that you're acknowledging that you've, you've read it. Um, there's not gonna be a quiz, but uh, if you could, there's a sign off page. If you could just sign um, when you have read it and then scan that sign off page to me and then I'll collect them uh, and have it on file just in case there was any, any concern, okay? Uh, so thank you for that. Um, Crystal's not here tonight. I just wanted to mention that Crystal was in contact with me. I know she has joined at least one other board um, and apparently in doing so found out that their meetings may conflict with ours on, on the third Thursday of the month. And she wanted to know if there was any consideration to changing our meeting. Um, I know it took us a while to kind of land on Thursdays being a good night for everybody. Um, and you know, I, I know that um, obviously Bill's got planning board, I've got select board. Um, select board, we may or may not be throwing in another, an extra meeting uh, during the course of the month. But um, since she's not here, I don't think we need to fully discuss it. I just wanted to bring it up and mention um, that we probably will will discuss that further at another, another meeting, okay. Uh, and with that, uh, wanted to, I think, I'm actually not sure. So um, I don't know if everybody knows Ann McKenzie. Ann McKenzie is our superintendent of schools for, gosh, Annie, how many near, years now? This is year 10. And thank yeah. you for being on the committee that hired me. Molly, <laughs> I love working here. I really do. I love this town. I love my job. So thank you for that. And this is I just in my 10th year. Wow, that's great. Well, we're very happy to have you. Thank you. Uh, and the reason that uh, we've invited Anne here tonight, I believe in a couple of previous meetings, we've talked about um, kind of how decisions get made and the paradigms that people have in their heads. We all have them. Um, things that were true at one point in time may or may not still be true. Um, things have changed and people don't always necessarily have data updated. So we thought uh, it would be a wonderful idea to separate perhaps fact from fiction and find out um, from you, Annie, uh, you know, really what the enrollment trends are in particular in the schools. And the reason that's important to our committee, um, as you're probably aware, because um, I know you've participated in some discussions about affordable housing and things like that. Um, I think it's really important for people to understand what the capacity there is, if any, um, in the Hadley schools and what some of the challenges are you you see relative to housing in town as well, because you're certainly on the front line with some families, um, you know, who may be challenged relative to that topic in town. And, uh, you know, in particular, you know, one longstanding talking point um, for many people is that one of the reasons not to add housing stock in Hadley is because it will absolutely tax the school system and our schools can't afford it and we would be forced to build or uh, an addition or, or do something dramatic with the schools. So anyway, that's the backdrop and what we talked about as a committee. Um, 
So I'll kind of turn it over to you, I guess. Sure, sure. And I'm happy to um, provide, talk about things in terms of trends and what we're seeing in a general way. I also can certainly cite specific data. Um, what I hear anecdotally, sometimes from the people who speak with me in town um, about barriers to purchasing property in Hadley. Um, and uh, you asked the question about uh, capacity, school capacity in, and, um, in terms of enrollment. So our enrollment, so we have total enrollment and total enrollment in schools is a combination of what's referred to as foundation enrollment, which is resident enrollment. Um, and we'll just leave it at resident enrollment because we don't have a Metco program. So foundation enrollment is resident enrollment. And the rest of our enrollment is comprised of school choice. So we call that school choice receiving. Students who choose to come to Hadley Public Schools, they reside in another community. Resident enrollment is uh, an important number. So who, how, who are the students in, in Hadley Public Schools for whom Hadley is fiscally responsible, their residents, and attending our public schools? That resident enrollment number um, is also correlated, that foundation enrollment number also connects with chapter 70 funding. So the state aid that the town receives, um, and that is earmarked the chapter 70 funding for public education. Because Hadley, like many, many communities throughout the Commonwealth, but particularly in Franklin County, Berkshire County, and Hampshire County, because Hadley has seen declining enrollment, we are a district that's considered hold harmless. So thankfully, the leg state legislature has a hold harmless provision in Chapter 70 funding, which means that the town has not seen a significant decrease in state aid for public education in Hadley. But it also means that um, hold harmless means it doesn't increase by all that much. However, expenses, whether that's fuel oil, um, that certainly was a a huge increase um, in the last couple of years, or heating oil, um, or uh, cost of living allowances associated uh, with employee wages, or just expenses in general. Expenses increase, um, but we're we're held harmless. So when declining enrollment go, when we have declining enrollment, it does have a financial impact on the town. What we've seen in resident enrollment, so number of school-aged children in town is since at, a, at, I would say, almost like a high point of enrollment, which probably would have been right around the time that Molly got on the school committee. So that was probably, the peak was probably around 2012. It was before I got to the district. And uh, the enrollment was upwards of 700 students. But I have been tracking since um, I got to the district. And that foundation resident enrollment was 487 in fiscal year 15. So that would have been the 14, 15 school year. And our current, now it hasn't been certified by, by the state, but currently that resident enrollment based on, we know who's, who's in our schools right now is about 378. It's a 22% decrease in about 10 years. Thankfully, our school choice numbers have increased. The lowest that they were was in the last 10 years was 79. And this year, currently, we have 125 school choice students. So that has increased by about 58%, which thank goodness, because that means we use a considerable amount of school choice monies to um, cover operational expenses. So those are the trends. The New England School Development uh, Council, it's an organization, its acronym is NESDEC. They do enrollment projections for school districts. They use a cohort analysis and they look at, um, they look at preschool age children. They look at your kindergarten enrollment over time. So they do an analysis, they do projections. They do anticipate that 
school enrollment will start to gradually tick up but by 20 foundation enrollment, right? This is not school choice. School choice is separate. So we always hope to attract many families through school choice. It's very good for the school. It's very good for the town. Um, but they anticipate that resident enrollment should begin slowly ticking up, actually beginning right about now. Um, and they anticipate that that should go up to once again, perhaps over 500. These are their estimates. Um, and they're predicting that right around 2030, I believe. I can pull up that report. Again, these are their estimates. Um, so the trend that we have seen has been this steady and rather steep decline of resident enrollment. Thankfully, we've offset that by really trying to advertise and attract school choice students. And again, we've hit an all-time high, the highest numbers ever this year in 125 students. So those are our enrollment trends. You asked a question about capacity, certainly, as I said, and uh, before I arrived, when about when I think Molly got on school committee, there were probably, there were over 700 students enrolled in the schools. Um, so certainly the school buildings and the district has a capacity, has served many more students than we're currently serving now. Um, and you asked me about trends, you asked me about capacity, um, and I did talk to you about the connection to between foundation enrollment and Chapter 70 funding for the town. I did say I would comment on, now I want to be very clear, I don't have, I don't have quantitative data to suggest, to, to talk about housing availability or affordability or anything like that. This is strictly anecdotal. It is not empirical. Mm -hmm. I will say to you that Frequently, even sometimes our school choice families, they are very, they're keen to live in Hadley. They do talk about a tight housing market and the affordability. They talk about uh, a lack of uh, the affordability of housing and uh, a lack of a lot of available housing. Um, and I think those are all the things you asked me about. Yeah. Well, if I could put some housing numbers to this, well, we're part of the reason we're asking is we're dipping our toe into the water about uh, alternative housing situations, mm -hmm. whether it be uh, you know, multifamily uh, duplexes or triplexes or actually the A word apartments. And the one concrete First of all, we already have a baseline of apartments. We have 11% affordable housing. Most of that consists of apartments, but it doesn't convert one-to-one -to, -one to students because that includes uh, senior housing and the uh, um, the group homes for the uh, disabled. Um, so we have the Econo Lodge, which is a proposal for a mix of 50 50 units mixed between one bedroom and studios. And they, uh, CDC says that based on their experience across their inventory, the, they're really looking at 40% or more of uh, senior citizens in those units. And they're not really anticipating there'll be a lot of children. There may be incidental children um, single parents um, in a transitional phase, but they're not expecting a lot. Um, then we had a proposal for um, a, a property at the intersection of North Maple and um, Rocky Hill Road. So basically just the opposite side of 116 from where we, where we hide our buses. Um, and that was upwards of 250 units um, and a mix from uh, studios to three bedroom, I believe. Um, we expect that most of those would be actively marketed to the UMass student community and probably not a big jump, but it could be a population spike, maybe without a school spike. So, we're just 
hoping it, it, in the same sense that we also, every time we look at, well, let's put in 50 apartments and say, well, what's the sewer impact of that going to be? Are we going to have to build a new sewer plant? And are we going to have to build a new school? And uh, you know, I'm, I think there's also the, you have the building capacity in there, I believe. I, honestly, I, I don't want to correct you, but I uh, would say that 2012 was probably not peak enrollment. Um, I had over 80 kids in my graduating class. Now, admittedly, that was the biggest class in the history of Hopkins, but um, uh, there were some others around that time. So there were a few of us at, at, at that time, the entire hall between outside the cafeteria between the rear entrance and the um, gym was called the senior hallway. And I think you have locked off all of those lockers in yes. years I since. Think I take no offense to the correction. Just I was looking back, you know, I, I was looking back since Desi no, the numbers you yes. have. Yeah. Um, and I honestly don't know what the enrollment numbers were. Um, but uh, so the structural capacity is probably there, although I've heard that the elementary school is um, is tight. Um, but it's also just wondered where we stand on um human resources. And I'm sure that you can probably add five more kids in a class without having to hire a new teacher, but at some point you go over that magic number and now we have to have a, uh, a new, uh, an extra teacher. And um, I don't know how you are, how close you are on your student teacher ratios to, uh, to be able to, give any insight on how what when do you have to go out hiring oh, well, i know you're always hiring but well there's uh yeah typically the there are no uh fast and hard regulatory rules there are no strict regulatory rules that say you must have a student teacher ratio of x uh our historically since i've been here and i think since before i got here our school committee our community appreciates uh, smaller class sizes. So we aren't a place that typically wants to see elementary classrooms with 30, 33 children. Um, we have added classrooms probably, I think y'all did once right before I got here. And then I think twice since I've been here. And it seems like when a classroom hits about 25, when a, so when a grade hits 50, it's about 25 in the elementary, the elementary, then um, we look to add a classroom to that particular grade. And I believe that's happened twice since I've been here and once right before I got here, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe well long before that. So it doesn't happen all that often, but that's about, it doesn't mean the school committee couldn't change their mind, decide to increase that, decrease that. Usually when population, when we see and and for any reason, even an influx in population, for example, districts right now in the Commonwealth are seeing a tremendous influx in population in terms of migrant students in Massachusetts. Um, frequently, they don't all come into the same grade. They're usually dispersed in such a way that um, that doesn't mean that you don't require additional staff, although that is difficult to predict on, in any given year. It could be because of the nature of individual education plans that we may need additional staff for a group of students or a particular student. Um, and then those needs change. So every year that kind of changes. In terms of expenses, I I'm, I'm always want to be very clear and very grateful this town is very, very good to all of its municipal departments, um, supportive and it's, and it's generous. And I appreciate that very much. And because we appreciate that so much, we work very hard to be good stewards of the town's resources. I was trying to pull up some of my uh, budget presentation documents, but aside from there was a, a year in which there was a, a pretty, a, market budget increase when there was an adjustment 
um, to the Unit A salary schedules. I think the town saw something similar when they evaluated their public safety salary schedules as well. When it was clear that these particular salaries were very kind of not in line uh, with what people were paying regionally. That happened in the school department in about fiscal year 14. I think Molly just gone to the select board at that time and it was in about fiscal year 14. But since then we work really hard to um, request what I, I would say are responsible budget increases. So anywhere, sometimes we've requested zeros uh, I, I did give the town a zero year. As a matter of fact, it's even a negative during COVID because we ended up returning money to the town. Um, two years in a row, we returned money to the town. And then they, maybe between one and 3%. Um, so there are, uh, I just was at a meeting today and superintendents were talking about 12% increases and um, double digit increases that, and that's not something. So we do, we do try very hard to be responsible um, and good stewards of the resources the town does give us. Annie, can I just ask a question? <clears throat> Admittedly, I've tried very hard to forget the school funding formulas. Um, <laughs> uh, but when you're talking about uh, again, the Chapter 70 money being tied to mm -hmm. the foundation enrollment, right? And then the school choice has its own um, kind of price tag that comes along with that, right? Mm -hmm. From your standpoint, is is there any difference um, in the mix of students? So, for example, if, if foundation enrollment actually increased and then we're completely in control of how many school choice students come in. I mean, obviously we're not gonna throw anybody out that's already in, but mm -hmm. you it, you wouldn't necessarily need to bring as many choice students in. Um, is there an opt optimal mix? Are we better off with a higher foundation resident population and given how the chapter 70 formula works and fewer school choice or are, is it the other way around or is it neutral? No, I I suppose one could argue, and and you have done your best to forget Chapter Seventy funding formula, and I am not a wizard at it. Let's say that I'm I'm very comfortable with it, but it is a complex formula. However, I would say that um, because what, what the Chapter Seventy funding formula does is it the question is what is adequate funding to what is the funding needed to provide an adequate, I think, education for a student? And they have various cost factors that they look at. They have, whether it's instruction, uh, leadership, facilities, and they say, this is what it would cost. And they actually, it's a different cost depending on high school student, middle school student, an elementary student, and also there are weighted factors. If a student is a vocational student, they know that's more expensive. If a student, they presume a certain percentage of students will have special education needs that will cost more. And so, and in that formula, they say, this is our per pupil expenditure for this particular district and for the state, what this is. And that is, um, let's say usually closer to $12,000. And school choice receiving, when we receive a, a student for school choice, that district pays us $5,000. Now, some people, I want to be very, very clear, because some people very quickly will then say, well, then the town is losing money. Are you telling me that every school choice student costs us $7,000? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So the school choice students weren't there. Again, I'm thrilled that we have 125. I don't have 125 school choice students concentrated in two grades, that if they all left, we would turn off some lights, turn down the heat and reduce our staff. They're distributed across the entire district. So that revenue is revenue that we will have those expenses if the students weren't there, right? I don't turn off a light if I lose one child. I don't, I don't turn down the heat. So we're not, I just wanna be clear about that because sometimes Yes, in chapter 70, to your point, Molly, the per pupil expenditure that one receives for resident enrollment, right, 
mm-hmm. is higher. And it's, it's calculated every year and it goes up slightly every year. Um, and so let's say that's roughly $12,000 and the school choice receiving is five. We're not losing $7,000. It's just because right. we're not, we're, again, if they weren't here, I'm not turning off lights. And part of the reason there's that, that difference, right? So one might say, well, why, do, why don't we just get all of the money? Right. So a student choices in from Granby. Why don't why don't I get to bill Granby twelve thousand dollars? Because they recognize in school choice that Granby doesn't turn off a light when somebody leaves. Right. Mm-hmm. There isn't a one for one correlation in the student leaves and it goes mm-hmm. and the expenses associated go down by that much. Right. Mm-hmm. So so does that answer your question about what's I mean, I, I don't know that I would say. I'm going to say which is better or which is preferable. I know you're asking that directly. There's there's no perfect mix there, or but just in straight funding for the town, the amount of funding that one receives for resident enrollment is higher than what one receives for school choice receiving. That I can say quite plainly. No, I think that's that's exactly mm-hmm. uh, answering the question. Uh, Justin, Mark, Emma, any other questions for for Annie while we have her? Uh, I think if I could just maybe restate Molly's question and make sure I understand the answer completely. Um, using the number 700 that you gave us, just let's, let's pretend that that's the max capacity of the school system in town. If all 700 of those seats were filled by foundation enrollment and zero choice, the operating revenue would go up, right? Is it a, it's a simplification, but is that an, an assumption we could make? I think you might be needed. Yeah, I did. So, uh, what you could you can say the ch- the chapter seventy funding that the town would receive from the state government would increase. Yes, yes. Okay. That revenue would increase. Mm-hmm. Right, because I, I think Molly, you know, at the sort of the heart of the question why we're asking these questions specifically is you know try and maybe either prove or dispel the myth that more housing means more cost. Right. It sounds like there is some increase in revenue associated with foundation enrollment, which means you know, if the schools aren't currently at capacity, and we're not talking about building new facilities, increasing housing stock in Hadley might not have a meaningful impact on the operational budget of the school system. Is that a, a fair assessment? The only thing I would caution people with is that um, we, we could not have any change in foundation enrollment and we could have increased costs at the schools that is that are associated with the needs of the students who are there. So it's it's. I just want to be very clear that fluctuations in budget do not consistently directly correlate with exactly the number. Like for every new student we get, we see an increase of this. Those things. It is really dependent upon the students who are who are in front of us, right? So it just depends on the needs of the students at the time. Mm-hmm. So um, some of the drivers being uh, second uh, or uh, English language learners can have some additional costs associated, um, IEPs, depending on the level of complexity and need, um, and then students opting to go out to vocational schools as well. I remember that being a, a big driver. Yeah. So you're right. So you could theoretically, like you're saying, if you had only 12 new students come to town, but all of them had an IEP, even if they were foundation kids, theoretically, you know, I mean, I, I can't imagine that happening, but but that's the cautionary tale I think I'm hearing. Yeah, okay. Yeah, clearly there are a lot of moving pieces here. Um, yeah, it is difficult to predict, I would just say. It's difficult to predict that uh, in, in, in any given year what the needs will be of the students that you have. Emma? Oh, we can't hear you. <laughs> you are not muted. You. Oh, the headphones I have are not helpful. But no. I just want to say, um, I just, I really appreciate also, Bill, what you brought in terms of that potential housing project um, and it not having a a projected impact on on potential students in town. uh, I think that's a big knowledge gap for our community um, and a big 
place of anxiety for our community, right? Anytime that we're adding housing um, is what's going to be the increased burden. I hate to say that word, but um, or impact uh, that it's going to have on our community. So I think that's huge. And I just, I really appreciate Annie, Annie's uh, presentation tonight. Um, I think the intricacies with with students, you know, all, all three of my kids are, are in the school system right now. So we certainly experience them and appreciate all the staff and all the work that all of you do. Um, but, but it is really, it, it's a lot to dive into. So I think this was a great topic for tonight. So good to see you, Emma. Thank you. <laughs> Thank You're all welcome. of you for being so thoughtful. These questions are so complex and they're so hard and it's, it's just really nice to see people civically engaged and doing this kind of thoughtful work on behalf of the other residents. I'm grateful. That's why I like working here. So thank you all for doing this. And thank you for your time, Annie. I know it's a busy time of year for you. Yeah. Well, if you're good with me, I'm going to go have a, whatever's just been made in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> Gin and tonic. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. If you're, if you're all set, then. Is, are you guys good? All yes. right. Thank, Thank you, you so much. All right. All right. Good night. Everyone. Good night. Okay. I think that's uh, great. If that's I can good make just one quick comment uh, to piggyback on on Emma and and Bill. Uh, you know, I've probably been involved in I don't know approaching ten thousand apartment units as an architect across the country, and one of the things this is this is anecdotal. It's not empirical evidence, but one of the things that I hear from developers all the time is that there are often more dogs than kids in their projects because this <laughs> question about schools comes up in every jurisdiction around the country. Everybody asks this question. If we're adding 300 units, does that mean we have some percentage of children that have to get put in the school system? And the answer is most of the time, no, there's, there's very right. few that actually end up uh, matriculating into the school system as a result of new housing units. And I mean, that's just my personal experience. I can't say that with, any evidence or data to back it up, but I think it's an important distinction. And, and as Emma mentioned, it's something that I think a lot of people don't uh, intuitively understand. Yeah, and I think so, um, another, I was just, something just for the, you know, I know a lot of people are tuning into these um, meetings, you know, and either watching after the fact or whatever. And uh, I also just want to be clear from our group's perspective, this was one specific data point that we were trying to get to tonight. Um, and by no means are we suggesting that that's the only um, only consideration in terms of, of whether or not developments are, are appropriate for our town. It's just a specific single data point that we wanted to get more information from an expert on. So the um, planning board had been talking about the overall population bump from putting in a large apartment development. If you add the uh, Connell Lodge and the um, uh, the um, Rocky Hill Mount Warren, uh, Rocky Hill South Ma uh, North Maple, um, call it three hundred units, and let's say there's an average of two people per unit. Um, that's adding six hundred people to the population, which is a, at least a ten percent bump in the town's population overall. Mm -hmm. And admittedly, the impact on the schools of that 10% bump will be wait, awaits determination. But um, one of the things, even, even the state admits it, the uh, executive office is not executive office of housing and community development anymore. It's changed its name again. But they used to publish, among other things, um, what one of the truisms of planning is that uh, residential development is more expensive than commercial development. Mm -hmm. uh, you add 300 units with 600 people, 700 maybe, and um, that is an overall call on services across the board, right. um, whether it be public safety, ambulance, uh, senior DPW, center. DPW is pumping more water, processing more sewage. Um, the uh, at some point uh, you trigger the uh, town clerk now has to have a a second precinct for voting, so the elections become more expensive. 
So it's a ripple effect. And um, it's one that we don't see with commercial development, not with non-residential commercial development, because I don't want to say apartment complexes aren't commercial, but um, that the, the population impact across the board is something that was is being talked about when we're looking at some of these things. Not mm -hmm. so much exclusively the impact on the schools. So I guess on the economic side of that, you know, economic half of our committee, um, I guess I, I wonder wonder if there's a way to quantify, you know, revenue increase as a result of population increase through taxes, or you know, if it's a commercial multifamily property, there's there's some taxes associated with that property. Is there mm -hmm. any way that we could quantify that so that we could say with some confidence that, you know, whatever increase in demand on services or cost of elections might be offset, even if it's a percentage offset by increase in revenue? Do we have a way of running that math? There's probably some data we could glean from the uh, tax collector's office um, because all uh, she collects all the real estate taxes and the water and sewer charges. So, um, you know, it probably is a fairly simple projection if we had, um, I, I don't know, as we, yeah, there are comparables. The, uh, the, the former Winfield is apartments. So we have a sense of how, how that's assessed and what revenue it brings in. Um, I, I think that's that, that's direct revenue, Bill. You know, and I think that one is easier for us to get a hold of. I and I I think what Justin's talking about is kind of a, I'll call it the indirect impacts of more people going to McDonald's, more people going to uh, ha having relatives visit from out of town and filling hotels and and shopping revenue and that type of thing. And I I believe um, when we had the folks from the university and and we'll that's later on the agenda. That's one of the things that they said that they could do for us if we wanted to engage in that way, that that they will look at the, the um, revenue and cost impacts relative to certain types of development projects using whatever data tools they have. I just say there's actually a couple of uh, models, some some local, um, but also some um, some pretty inexpensive models. I'm sure the um, is it the Donahue Center? Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Do we have access to them? Yeah, I, I think they have um, access to the to the uh, computer models, the the econometric models that do estimate that. It's called the implant model. Um, Im implant. So, in plan um, in is plan. one of the models. There are others. I don't know if you remember Remy uh, regional economic models used to be on Main Street. Sure. That was that was run by George Trey's uh, UMass professor. Um, that's a really high end, expensive one, but in plan is very reasonable, um, and I think that's what Donahue has. Um, but that actually spits out all of both the revenues generated in taxes and the additional um, expenditures at restaurants, at, at, uh, at bars, at, at retail establishments. You, you know, the, the good ones, the Remy one, for instance, you can just plug in, you can say, okay, 600 new residents in this, uh, in this new development and it'll, it'll spit out the numbers, but, but you can get those numbers for, for all that. Okay. That's great. I think that that would be worth looking at, especially, you know, when we're talking about how do we demystify this and, and put it into terms that are easy to understand? If there's a metric that we can generate with some level of confidence that says for you know every unit or for every additional 10 people that we, we add to the town's population, there's a net revenue increase or a net revenue decrease. You know, If we could have that number, I think that would help us make educated decisions about how to actually uh, solve this problem. Mm -hmm. For sure. Uh, Mark, could you send around just put it maybe put it in an email so we're sure that we're looking for the right thing. Just uh, mention the 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 model. Um, sure, sure. I used to uh, I actually used to work at Remy <laughs> years ago. Um, 
and and they I don't know if you guys remember they were right on Route Nine. They're over in Amherst now, but um, but the implant model is very reasonable. And I, again, I think Donahue has the implant model, um, so we could get them to run it, and we wouldn't even have to buy it. Um, so I'll send out an email on that, and I'll um, I'll is, do you know it, the uh, the people we're talking with at UMass are they connected with Donahue? Are they um, are they, uh, they're. They're, they're, in landscape, the they're landscape they're arch landscape architecture and regional planning uh i'm sure there are some um that regional planning makes me think they probably have the connection with donahue to do just this exact kind of economic impact so they yeah do. i would think so you want to um would it be helpful maybe <clears throat> probably make some sense to move up the agenda item to for the umass project assistance and talk about that now before we move on to the others um, so where we last left off, as you recall, I believe it was back in May, where we had met with um, a couple of the professors over at the university uh, with Tony Maroulis, and they laid out um, kind of a, a, an array of <clears throat> services that they could provide to us. Um, some of them they said might uh, they might be willing to do uh, for free based on it being, you know, kind of student oriented work. But if we wanted to raise it up a level and specifically they started talking about this, you know, kind of the more of a, um, you know, infrastructure impacts and all of that, that would really more heavily involve the folks at the professor level, that that was something that we might, um, they could certainly do for us, but they are not going to do it for free, that we would, we would need to come up with some money for that. <laughs> So just to bring you up to speed, uh, the town administrator and I had a meeting with the new chancellor. Um, that's part of the contract that we have with the university. Once a year, we have the opportunity to just uh, do a little bit of a meet and greet, talk about you know, what's on our mind, needs for the, of the town, how we can collaborate better, you know, those types of, of things. And one of the things that I was incredibly impressed with immediately is the, the new chancellor, um, Javier uh, Reyes, is very much focused on economic development and find, you know, finding career paths, uh, being able to keep graduate students local. Uh, and he has a fair amount of experience at a couple of other university systems in working with the greater community. And, and he's casting a, a wide net um, in his conversations about community. He's not just talking about, you know, the town of Amherst um, and Hadley, but I mean, Amherst, Hadley, and then, you know, going out beyond that, Sunderland, Belchertown, whatever, um, and trying to figure out what sort of, um, I'll call them, you know, the proverbial win-win situations um, might exist between the university and, and the municipalities. Uh, he's very sensitive to concerns about student housing and all of that. <clears throat> so we, we actually didn't talk much about student housing. He, he was very much focused on um, finding incubator space, bringing businesses from Boston to open up uh, you know, kind of satellite offices more proximate to the campus, you know, that that type of um, conversation and how could that benefit the town of Hadley? And basically at the end of the conversation, the way that we left it was uh, we mentioned that, you know, we had already had a little bit of conversation with the university about potentially helping us, but that the cost of that assistance might be a bit of a gating item, given the fact that it's not something we have laying around in a in a budget. Um, and he said, let me think about that. So I want to be clear, there's no firm commitment, but it sounds like it's something that he's very keenly interested in doing in a collaborative way. Um, and the other part of the conversation we had was he also recognizes that the intent isn't that um, that means that UMass is now driving the conversation. He he is keenly aware of it being a resource issue um, and something where the professors and the regional planners might be able to bring ideas to us. Um, so 
Uh, Tony wasn't able to be here tonight because they have a, I think a block party or something going on in, in downtown Amherst right now. Um, but Tony said he's hoping to have an, an update for us soon. Um, and so hopefully at the October meeting, we'll have more information and know if we're going to be able to move forward in that regard. And, and I think the ask from us is going to be, you guys need to tell us exactly what it is you want us you know, to work on, be very specific. And then I'm sure it wouldn't be until the next semester, but then maybe in January they could get going on something like that. It sounds really promising and uh, I'm glad that that conversation went well. I, you know, I, I'd throw out too that we often think about housing uh, associated with UMass as student housing, but UMass is one of the largest employers and they, you know, they have a tremendous number of employees who would probably love to live closer to UMass than Greenfield or Belchertown or, you know, wherever it is they're commuting from. Uh, additionally, UMass is a research university. So, you know, there's potential for biomed industries and, you know, other research-based organizations to come in and take advantage of that uh, expertise and talent pool that UMass offers. So it, Hadley being where it is, you know, there are, a, I think, a lot of opportunities that we could be exploring with UMass that are not necessarily student housing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And and as Mark's, you know, saying, they obviously have access, whether it's the Donahue Inst Inst uh, Institute or Collins Center. I always get them confused. I don't know if they're one and the same or they're, I think they're different, but um, they, they would certainly have ready access. Well, to Justin's point, um, the we created the Hadley University Park in part uh, the industrial district off of uh, North Maple Street, in part as part of a conversation with the university and Western Mass, West Mass Development Corporation, I think was having the conversation more directly um, with the idea of creating incubator space. And one building was put up uh, primarily as an office building. Um, and... Um, I'm not sure that it really got all that much traction. There are a couple of other, uh, there's a plant that's manufacturing vitamin extracts in there. And there is um, a company that uh, makes makes and maintains medical technology uh, equipment. And then the um, that educational, uh, I forget. Pearson. Pearson um, moved from actually moved from five locations in Amherst into one big building, which functionally was all office. They built a second big building, um, and then then they when they contracted, they sold that to the university for unknown purposes. I guess it's overflow office space. Um, so I think that's pretty much built out now. I don't think there are any lots left in the Hadley University Park, and it didn't play out as the incubator, the the tech incubator that we might have hoped it was going to be. Um, but it's Class A office space, and uh, there's obviously a market for that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so more to more to come on that front, and then again, the the key thing being, you know, we can we can certainly be driving um, that conversation, whether we want them to, to focus in on, you know, a smaller area or, or expand it or, or whatever. So um, I'm cautiously optimistic that we'll be able to work, work something out with them. Okay. Um, so going back to the agenda, so affordable housing update. Um, so Bill, I, I, just curious, it's the month of September. Did those magic numbers for the, uh, that were supposed to be out in May, did they ever get published or are we still working with the old? We're, I think we're still working with the old one. Um, the I think the ratio has gone down somewhat. Um, the number is available. We were at 12, we're now at, at 11. But as far as I know, it hasn't been officially certified by the census, 
And until that data set is certified by the Census Bureau, the state's not going to update. So uh, I'll I'll try to take a look. Maybe I can find uh, find out if something happens. But I haven't haven't heard of anything um, changing. Although we know we know what the number will be, so we know it's going to go down. We just don't have it uh, officially yet. And the um, sort of on the affordable housing, the planning board's continuing to discuss a uh, 40R zoning district. Um, the state said that they'd really like to see one that encompassed not only the Connell Lodge and Mountain Farms Mall and Hampshire Mall, but also the other side of Route 9. Um, the Home Depot and the uh, Lowe's parcels and everything in between, which was a little bigger than we were anticipating, but that's no nothing set in stone. The um, The trick with the 40R is before we can take it to the town meeting, we have to, we have to define the district. Then we have to submit it to Boston, get their sign off on it before we can even take it to town meeting. So that's not going to be anything that's going to fall town meeting. And at the rate we're going, it probably won't go to spring town meeting. But we will, um, working with Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, um, to develop some grants to defray the cost of uh, putting together a proposal of some sort. We uh, don't know what it's going to look like yet. Are there any other um, zoning discussions going on that have anything to do with the Route 9 corridor? Or? Uh, not at present. Um, the uh, we have we'll, we'll have a couple of hyper technical um, zoning amendments that are nothing to do with Route 9 or housing issues. Um, and the other thing we were working on, but I don't think we'll, we'll, we won't have that ready either, is um, battery only uh, energy storage. Yeah. Where they're not, they don't have solar panels. They're not using solar panels to fill the batteries. They are using the grid to fill the batteries at off peak periods. Um, but that's, again no no housing issues not really any economic development issues the big question is whether they where they can go mm -hmm. um yeah. so we're kicking around that um i will maybe mention if i'm not jumping the gun molly did circulate a op-ed or an essay that appeared in the gazette yeah. um I, I checked my emails um, and um, I'm not familiar with the, the group that he referenced as having as having studied housing uh, issues in Hadley. Um, I it is someone I, it, it was written by someone who did um, have a couple of conversations with me about the uh, possibility of um, opening a bed and breakfast or perhaps an accessory apartment. Um, I directed them to the uh, sec relevant sections of the bylaw and um, we never heard back. So nothing, they, they never filed anything. Um, I, perhaps just the, the density of the zoning bylaw discouraged them, but um, I have, just have to uh, see how that plays out. Yeah, I mean, for me, it, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to beat a horse if it's dead, but I don't think the horse is dead yet. Um, I keep coming back to, you know, get in, in the absence of a town planner, in the absence of, you know, we don't, we don't have a mayoral system here. Um, you know how do how do we advance these conversations? Because 
I think there's so much um, misinformation about this topic in general of kind of zoning and housing. I mean, it's complicated, like how it works, how long it takes to get changes through, who's driving the changes, you know, who's managing the master plan, what role does the select board play? If that, I mean, all of that stuff. Um, and I, it's a topic, I mean, I, I was just, before our meeting started, I caught the first part of the age dementia friendly presentation over at the senior center. Major topic of conversation, of course, was housing. So, you know, so there, there are different segments of the population that are keenly interested in this, um, but they don't—they don't know what to do. They don't know how to, how do we try to get the town to do something? Is the question I keep getting, and um, you know, I, I know I've had conversations with some of you about you know frustration about how how long things take, or are we actually accomplishing anything? You know, are, are we are we moving something forward? So, you know, I. I I think if we do nothing else, I just feel like maybe our, our group could play a role on being a convener in terms of bringing people together to, to hear what we heard tonight from Ann McKenzie. Again, there, there are a lot of people out there that they're going to continue to to talk about what they think is right. And I mean, they, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, they, they firmly believe what they're saying, um, but it's unencumbered with with facts and, and you know, to Justin's point and, and marks, you know, about the economic impacts, um, bringing people in, in in just general terms to talk about, um, you know, as opposed to, you know, looking at the uh, the specific development on, on Rocky Hill Road that may be controversial for many reasons, you know, but just the idea of adding housing and then Bill, your point about, you know, do we really want to increase our population by 10%? In, in a six month period, you know? Um, so I'm, I'm st I continue to be interested in putting something like that together. Um, I, I feel like it's something we might be able to do, you know, at the senior center, maybe over the winter when people are uh, looking for something to do <laughs> after the holidays, I don't know. Yeah, I think Molly, I'll, I'll jump on that because I, I obviously am very passionate about this subject. I joined the Housing and Economic Development Committee for this purpose to just sort of push Hadley forward in this arena. And um, I know reading the article, it kind of comes across as maybe the author was jaded or you know, had a bad experience and was letting out some steam. I just want to be clear that those sentiments that were expressed in that article, I've heard from many people across the Pioneer Valley who look at Hadley as having a significant opportunity and most feel it's squandered, you know, and it's, uh, unfortunately, it's a, it's a function of our location, which is great. You know, we're right along the Connecticut river. We have access to the waterfront sandwiched between Amherst and Northampton, which have significantly higher population density than we do. Um, so the entire region is looking at us to help relieve the pressure on this problem, this crisis in housing. You know, we have land, we have the ability to facilitate new developments, uh, but from the outsider's perspective, it appears like we are just obstinately refusing to do anything. And I know that that's not 100% true. So I think where my interests lie is to actually find actionable solutions, things that we can put in place, take steps towards, uh, you know, whatever the answer is, I don't, I don't know, I can't define that, but I think we need to try and start making a concerted effort to actually move this forward beyond just conversations. And that's where, um, I'm in full support of the idea of a town forum, uh, but I would caveat that, and I plan to join the next select board meeting to propose this, is that we need to resolve the, the um, notification system before we can have an effective town forum. The, the representation, I think, in current town meetings is a, a pretty small, potentially vocal minority, uh, and that there's a, a broader population of people that I would love to see engaged in this conversation, and it starts by reaching those people. So I think if we can figure out how to get the message out there that we're having this meeting, that we want to have a town forum, and then we can actually hold that forum and, and get the real feedback and give the real information similar to what we heard about the school enrollment numbers today, that might get us at least the support to move forward on whatever the solution is, so zoning overhaul, overlay districts, you know, spot zoning, whatever we decide the answer is, 
uh, I don't think it goes anywhere unless we start to engage the broader community. Well, it comes right down to getting getting seat, bottoms in seats at town meeting, since that's our only mechanism for amending the zoning bylaw. Um, I can, and if I put my mind to it, um, I would could probably name most of the 125 people who come to every town meeting. Mm -hmm. And um, the, uh, and, and I could probably tag them as whether they support zoning change or not. Um, and, you know, it, we need, it, ideally, I'd love to have a broader cross section of the community at town meeting. I don't know if that could be streamlined in some way. We, when Amherst was having nine consecutive sessions of town meeting, we took an inordinate pride in getting through our town meeting in one night. Uh, now that we don't have to, uh, now that we're out of that competition, maybe we can split it up, but we have a quorum requirement of a hundred and, um, you know, you can get 125 to 150 for a meeting. Can you get them for two meetings, two, two consecutive weeks? Um, uh, you know, there'd be some, it, it's, it's going to be a challenge. Um, well, I think. I think part of um, the driver to get people to town meeting is, I mean, always, you know, if they need to know if there's a Warren article on there that they're interested in, you know, so anytime we have controversy, those are the, the numbers go way up. Right. Yeah. But I, I think people also want to feel like they know what's going on. And what I've noticed is that over the years, whether it's again, a particular topic, that's covered at a select board meeting or a planning board meeting, which causes people to actually engage just in a brief way, then it's like, oh, I, you know, there's, it, because the concept about town meeting comes up and then they're like, oh, well, maybe I should go to that. And then you start seeing some new faces at town meeting. And, and I'm hoping that if we do this kind of a forum, you know, on a pretty broad topic where people are very passionate on all ends of the, the spectrum on this, um, I think I think we would see an increase in attendance at town meeting because yeah, I, I a lot of people don't awesome. know that's where the you know that's where the power is. Yeah, I think too, Molly. Housing is definitely one that everybody relates to, right? We all experience it. You know, we're trying to get a town meeting and get a lot of people there to talk about sewer improvements. You're going to have less success, but I think because housing is such a crisis right now. And because everybody in town feels it, I mean, the property values are just outrageous. I mean, even, even rents, I know people who rent a tiny apartment and they pay more than I do for my mortgage. You know, this is, it's a real problem. And I think a lot of people are touched by it, which is a, a good motivator to get involved. Mm -hmm. But if I could channel my <clears throat> inner Joe Zagrodnik for a moment, <laughs> when you talk about the, density of Northampton, population density of Northampton and Amherst, uh, Joe would remind you that um, part of our charge is to feed the people, not, not necessarily to house them. And uh, Northampton is low on farmland. Um, Amherst, I think they have one working dairy farm left. And it's mm -hmm. mostly in, at, virtually in Hadley anyway. Hadley, yeah. Um, so um, it, it, actually, by the time you sort out, it, and I, I did send around the presentation I did to the uh, uh, the equity. I forget what diversity, equity, and inclusion, inclusion, yeah. inclusion um, a couple of years ago. Um, and I'd refer you to the um, um, the master plan and especially the map appendices to the match master plan that uh, we do have a lot of development constraints between slope wetlands and the APR program. Uh, it looks like we have a lot of land, but it's not available land. 
So part of um, what we've sort of, I've sort of come to the conclusion that the best development potential is adaptive reuse of the existing property because that doesn't get into uh that gets away from the preservation of farmland it isn't farmland it, that that question was answered 30 years ago mm -hmm. uh it is uh i think that's where our future is um you know i i, I don't see the garden apartment type layout that was proposed at North uh, North Maple as being and in the right place it looked like a fine design just needed to be in a better needed to be in the right place but we don't have a lot of those right places um I don't know what uh what the potential is but you know, we certainly in the past have tried to adapt at one point we rezoned the entire mountain farms mall as industrial because the mall at the time was in its death throes um and we thought that industrial in an industrial district you are still allowed to have retail so if the mall survived great but if the mall failed to thrive then we we're thinking maybe a warehouse or a manufacturing facility uh would be interested so uh yeah part of it is this this chicken and egg thing that and and i don't want to be cynical about it but um zoning is a blunt instrument it's not a scalpel it's more like a machete you can zone to encourage certain uses or discourage other uses but in the end it comes down to market forces and we have had some developers who have responded to mountain market forces uh barry roberts built east street commons as senior housing because he saw a market for it um the folks who are pushing the housing on uh, North Maple see a market for it. Um, be lovely if they, the um, uh, Econo Lodge, CD, uh, Valley Community Development Corporation obviously sees a market for its product there. And, you know, for better or for worse, that drives a lot of the discussion. Uh, um, but if someone wants to come in and say, yeah, I really would like, and that's what we talked about with uh, Hampshire Mall. Yeah, I really would like to talk about, can we put apartments to supplement our space? Um, that That is helpful to have something concrete to point to, as opposed to saying, yeah, we need more housing. So let's zone this section for apartments um then you don't know what you're going to get so it it's it's a juggling act yeah and i, I actually agree with a lot of what you stated bill I, and in in a lot of respects you know i i don't want to see a single development on our agricultural or open space anywhere and I, you know i was very vocal about that with the trinitas project i think um a counterpoint to that you know the argument about zoning is we just you we know, were putting in a, a self-service or a self-storage facility on a field that was you know right by the bike path. I think that's a terrible use of land, right? We've got car dealerships yeah. and service centers and single-story strip malls and all of these things that are going in because our zoning doesn't prohibit them and because it doesn't encourage the uses that we want to see. So I agree, blunt tool, absolutely. Yep. But the the tool that we have now isn't helping us, and I mean. We all look at the malls as kind of like our, you know, our commercial center. It's it's where you know, we get a lot of tax revenue. Totally agree, but brick and mortar stores have been dying for decades, and we're seeing that now with anchor tenants like Bed Bath and Beyond leaving. It's only a matter of time. So I think you know, my as an advocate for progress, my vote would be to say we should be studying zoning from a thirty thousand foot view town wide, and use that as a tool to discourage 
developments that we don't want to see, like the Trinitas property, which, you know, obviously I don't think they've decided not to move forward with that, but then encourage the developments we would like to see, like the infill adaptive reuse projects that might exist around the, the Hampshire Mall. Um, so the chicken and an egg question, I think the egg is zoning. And if we, it's not a, you know, if you build it, they will come kind of deal. But I think if, if we use zoning as the tool to help guide or, you know, create a framework for the future that we want to see in this town, it would prevent the self-storage units or it would prevent the car dealerships. And then it would encourage the mixed use multifamily developments that have restaurants on the ground floor that live in our town and, and bring a sense of community here. So I, I completely agree that we should not be touching our open space, the master plan, the housing development or the housing production plan. They all say the same thing, but doing nothing is hurting us, I think, more than it would if we were to do something. I just want to mention for background, the parcel where the storage facility is going has been zoned industrial since the adoption of zoning in Hadley. It was along the railroad track. That's fair. I'm only, I have a grievance because I bike on that path and that was one of my favorite views. Uh, DCR, so yeah. DCR had 40, uh, had 30 years to buy it if they wanted the view. That's fair. But, and and uh, I, again, you know, I don't want to be combative, but I, I do no, think no, that I, it's I, a perfect I, example of like, if, if our town cares about open space, we should have cared about that lot. But, you know, it, it doesn't seem like that's really the priority. It, you know, I, I don't know what the priorities are. But I think we need to establish priorities through mm -hmm. potentially a zoning overhaul, at the very least an overlay district, some some mechanism that'll encourage developments that we want to see. Yeah, and I think it would go a long way. Uh, you know, again, we can only work with, with the tools that we have available and, and the government structure that we have. You know, so right now, town meetings are not going to hear a zoning proposal unless it comes from our planning board, right? Um, and the planning board they're volunteers and they they can only do so much, you know, again, with like Bill said, they, they've been really hyper-focused on 40R right now. You know, they don't really have the capacity um, to be running, you know, parallel tracks on multiple zoning change proposals. Um, but I think, I think having this sort of a forum where you're hearing as many voices as possible, you know, of our 5,000 residents, um, telling us what they want, what they're looking for would be hugely helpful to, to the planning board, you know, to, to know what people are thinking. I mean, you know, the housing production plan goes so far, surveys go so far, but, um, and Bill, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm just, I'm just thinking of that, you know, it would be great for you guys to have more, more public sentiment, if I can put it that way to work with, to help you figure out where you spend your time. Yeah, that's um, that's how how the system works. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you do have a developer. The example I'd give again is Barry Roberts wanted to do a second project in senior housing. What needed to expand the zoning district to make that happen. So he brought that to town meeting uh, as a petition article, mm -hmm. and. Um, Unfortunately, well, unfortunately for him, it didn't go anywhere. Uh, that's not what the people who came to that town meeting wanted. Right. But I think it was attendance at that town meeting was driven by opposition and not support. Right. Yeah, clearly. Well, I mean, how did, I, I'm getting a sense that people do want to do some sort of a, a forum. Again, I think our committee can be the, the convener. Um, I think we can certainly, uh, you know, kind of sketch out what information we want to present. We can talk about, you know, how we want to do Q and A or, you know, breakout sessions, whatever, all of that stuff. Um, but I'm sure we want uh, other people to do a lot of the presenting, right? Um, you know, I actually wonder, Molly, um, on the, the forum piece, I, I wonder if it would be best to send a survey out to all residents first. Yeah, I'm not sure of the logistics of how to do that, but in my head, I'm, I'm imagining, you know, attendance to an in-person meeting is hard because, you know, you have to rely on people not having to work or, you know, not having to find childcare or you know, whatever it may be. 
Um, but then in addition at a town meeting, you know, hearing every person's voice is nearly impossible, although it can be ha- it can be done over multiple sessions. Uh, so I'm wondering if there's a way to collect data, <clears throat> excuse me, collect the data of, you know, what would you like to see, you know, which of the following are the top priority for you in the future of Hadley and try to generate some of that information so that we can come to that forum with a clear sense of what, you know, some percentage of survey respondents believe to be the highest priority and lowest priority and it can at least steer the conversation a little bit, even if they're not able to attend in person. I think we we have some of that. Maybe what I would ask you to do is look at the uh, the housing production plan. The questions are in the plan. The question there there was a survey in conjunction with the housing production plan, and. Um, the questions they asked are set forth in the in the plan w- along with their responses likewise and admittedly this is is more like 5 or 6 years old now uh the update to the master plan had a questionnaire that went out and the questions and the replies are tallied in one of the appendices to the uh, <clears throat> master plan update um, so I, I, some of that information has been gathered. Um, the most recent being the housing production plan, which would be two years old now. Um, and then the, um, the more, the broader scope being the master plan update. Um, I'd encourage you to take a look at those two documents and see if, see if there's a question that you would have asked that that wasn't asked. That there may well be. Um, my experience has been uh, it, that it it's a it's a project to get a questionnaire out. Um, there are a few techniques. Uh, I have doing it online. Um, we can usually piggyback a notice with the tax bills that go out quarterly. But it takes it's a lead time. So you you know, right now you'd be looking at maybe the tax bill that goes out March first for the right, last, November last quarter. Mm-hmm. Um but um the collector has been very uh supportive about putting the questionnaire and you, you put a notice in, you don't do the whole questionnaire, you say there's a questionnaire, the paper copies at the senior center, the library and town hall and uh, online here. Uh, I know that the uh, Russell School Committee, Russell School Redevelopment Committee did a questionnaire about a year ago about that specific. Uh, so we have some familiarity with how to get them out. Um, but the art form is how do you, what questions do you ask? Mm-hmm. And, yeah, that's fair. And I think I think a number of them have been asked and answered. Uh, admittedly, it's not brand new data, but um, take a look at it and, and, you know, just get back to us about whether you think that there's something, there's an unasked question that we should be looking at. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I'll definitely do that. And I think, you know, a lot's happened in two years. It's a very different landscape than it was when that was that was taken. But that might just be enough to, you know, at least get a pulse of the town. And that's that's really where my head was at was if we go in expecting to talk about zoning and housing and everybody says, hey, you know, we're up in arms about the retail establishments, you know, it, like it could completely derail the conversation. So I was thinking from a high level strategy is just identifying mm-hmm. what the highest priorities are so that we can focus the conversation on that. And that may already be established by those, those survey results. Yeah, I, th- I think, I think that survey goes a long way towards that. Um, and, but I like Bill's question, like, especially with your background, Justin, if you see holes, you know, that need to be filled, um, I'm sure we could find a way to do that. And I, so what I'm wondering, just in terms of kind of action items and moving this forward, um, you know, right now we're scheduled, our next meeting, um, you know, would be the uh, 
third Thursday in October. Um, Lynn Gray from the mall had um, planned on being at that meeting. And I'm, as I said, I'm very hopeful that, that UMass will be there as well. Um, do we also want to um, spend focused time talking about this forum or should we schedule like a one-off meeting just to talk about pulling together the forum or maybe two or three of us try to put some framework together for it to, to give to people to look at and react to? I mean, what do you think the best way is to handle this? What's, what's the, with public uh, meeting laws, there's a maximum number of people that can be involved in an effort before it has to be a public meeting, right? Is that two? Uh, in our case, uh, we have three, five, we have seven five. members. So yeah. it would be four. So three. Yeah. So th three people could get together without violating open meeting law. Okay. Uh, well, I'm happy to be involved in that. Um, I'll need a day or two to review the housing production plan, which I did read in its entirety at one point, but I've since forgotten the contents. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe the three of us then, uh, if that's the maximum, could get together sometime in the next week or so and talk about a uh, strategy for how we might move forward on that. Yeah, that's fine. Is that okay? Emma and, and Mark, are you okay with that? If uh, Justin, Bill and I just take a stab at it and then come back. Sounds good. I'm, I'm happy to let Mark or uh, Emma jump in. Mark I think it's great. I'm sorry, I'm I'm distracted by yeah. feral children over here, but um, but things are good, and I I really appreciate the things that you're bringing forward, Justin. I think you speak really well. Okay, well, I mean, Molly, you and I can meet if if uh, I Bill, you're probably a very busy person these days. Um, if you need a third, I can I can be the third if uh, if you need it. Oh yeah, sure. Sorry, I thought I saw you shake your head. No. <laughs> yeah, that's I wasn't sure either. But no, that'd be that'd be great, Mark. Okay. What I can do is I can set up a Zoom for you all anytime. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. I'll uh I'll shoot you some availability, Molly. I got to check my calendar, but um, and we can figure out when to get that on the calendar. And I guess, Molly, the question for you, as I understand, our our purview here is to make recommendations to the select board. Uh, is this forum something that you'd have to take to the select board at the next meeting or a meeting um, and request that we are you know, sort of permitted to, to put it on and, and we just move forward? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, actually, at last night's select board meeting, when we got to the part of the agenda that said items for future discussion, um, I mentioned to the board that, you know, I was keenly aware of, of any appointed subcommittees that are having conversations that it's good to check in uh, now and again. And with our committee, I mean, we were created by the select board, but I, obviously there's a very strong tie to planning board as well because of the nature of what we're talking about. Um, so I think it would be a good idea uh, to ask both the planning board and the select board just for um, some time in front of them and kind of tell them what we're what we're talking about you know if this university uh project's moving forward if we're uh, talking about having a housing forum um I, I don't think that there'll be any pushback but you never know so yeah i mean you're absolutely right we don't want to get out in front and, and uh, get our hands slapped in any way so um bill does that make sense oh yeah I mean, I, I think it also makes sense to go ahead and meet and create an outline of what you won't want to do because if you if we're just saying let's put on a show um <laughs> that's probably not not a good selling point but if we want to say we, it's time to talk about these three points um <clears throat> And we think that these four people would be good speakers to address it. I think that would be very helpful to put some, establish some fixed points for the discussion with either board. Yep. It is easy to get off track if it's too open an agenda. Okay. 
Yeah, I, that, I think that that works well. If everybody's in agreement with that. Okay, so Justin, Mark, and I will coordinate our, our schedules and, um, you know, whether we do it via Zoom, uh, we can always be happy to open up my office here too if we want to meet in person, if that works for, for you, uh, whichever way is most convenient for everybody. And then sure. we'll get that out. Um, and then just in terms of other action items, um, uh, Justin had just mentioned to me, I want to make sure, I'm going to send uh, an email to make sure that we have the most updated handbook out because there was the original handbook and then it got updated. Um, and I think it went through two iterations with the select board before we approved it. So I will make darn sure that the one that um, got voted on gets in everybody's hands. I think we've pretty much covered everything on the agenda. Anything um, else we need to talk about tonight or? No, I think uh, we hit hit the hour and a half mark. So <laughs> I'm very mindful of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nothing's right. coming to mind at the moment. Okay. Very good. Well, I'll plan on seeing well, everybody. I, Go ahead. I, I will just throw out that we um, at planning board we do try to uh, schedule our consultation with Pioneer Valley Planning Commission on the first Tuesday of the month. That's the actual planning part, as opposed to permitting, which is the um, the uh, next, um, the third Tuesday. So we're definitely, we'll be talking about chapter 40R with Ken Comia from the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission at our, I think it's October 3rd meeting, whatever the first Tuesday of October is. So mm -hmm. anyone who wants to either join the meeting by Zoom or watch it on um, YouTube, um, it will be a topic of conversation. Okay, good. And and that, you know, timing wise, it may work out because um, if we do the draft and then we bring it back to our group, and we're meeting the third Thursday in October, maybe just tentatively the first November meeting um, with the planning board might be optimal for us to get on the yep. agenda for an update and probably that same, you know, Tuesday with the planning board and then Wednesday select board will be meeting as well. Yep. Kind of target that. Okay. okay. Any Anything else? I'll make a motion to adjourn. I'll Is second. there a second? Great. All in favor? Aye. Aye.